We've heard it said that love is patient, kind, long-suffering, that it does not envy, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, is not selfish or provoked. But how consistently and how often must we practice these in order to consider it love? If I'm patient with my wife on Thursdays, can I rightly say I love her? If I'm kind to my kids on occasion, does that qualify? No, love is the commitment to the good of another. And while we are committed to their good, we'll live out those attributes of kindness, patience, long-suffering, humility. And because love is properly understood as a commitment, true love is not a feeling. So people often confuse love with attraction or infatuation. A parent who has feelings of love toward their child uh, but who is not committed to their good, does not truly love that child. What they would have would be more accurately referred to as feelings of affection or fondness. So people like to claim that they've fallen in love, right? But in reality, the only thing you can fall into is a hole, I think. And this is a big mistake to make because when we believe that love is something that just happens to us, When we think it's somewhat out of our control or it's dependent on the actions of others, uh, when we think love is something that we simply fall into, then we also believe it's something we can fall out of. Because love is a commitment, it's also a choice. And it's a choice that we have to make a thousand times a day, every single day. It's the choice to remain committed to the good of those around us, and especially to God, our spouses, and to our children. It's nice to attend an open view church because we believe that we actually have a choice. And, and it's a real choice. Our choices aren't just God choosing for us the thing he knew we would have chosen. And our choice isn't just the result of a chain reaction of choices from God's first choice to all the choices that others have made until our choice comes up, or at least choices don't have to be purely reactionary like that, though they sometimes seem to be. No, in all things, we truly have a choice. And that should be an encouraging thought, because if we don't like something about ourselves or our lives, we have the power to change it through our choices. So in the, in the hustle and bustle of everyday life, I sometimes take a step back and I ask myself, do I love God? Am I committed to God's good? When I ask God to search my heart, and reveal my wicked ways, I've noticed that I gravitate toward God not because of his love for me or because I feel particularly fond of him, which wouldn't be love anyway. Uh, And sadly, I, I rightly can't say that I'm committed consistently to his good. No, I tend to follow God simply because I truly believe he is the way, the truth, and my only shot at eternal life. For me, following God tends to be less about loving him and more about self-preservation and wanting to be on the winning team. And all in all, I think that's pretty dysfunctional. I imagine loving my wife or my kids or my friends in such a self-serving way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, Paul tells us, speaking of love, love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, So love does not seek its own. In other words, love is not selfish, right? So if love is the commitment to the good of another, and if a component of love is selflessness, then associating with someone just to get what I can out of them for myself is not love. No, loving our neighbor means being committed to their good without a need for reciprocation. Otherwise, it's still self-serving. I'll do good for you, so you do good for me. Imagine if love were conditional like that. Imagine a husband who's only committed to his wife's good when she's living up to his expectations, when her performance is adequate, when she's done enough for him. No, love should be unconditional. I'm doing good for you, for you. And then in addition to following God for my own self-preservation, I realized I also follow him out of fear. So Proverbs 9.10 tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. I love that verse. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, 
But the fear of the Lord is not the end of wisdom. We're not supposed to remain perpetually in fear of God. Otherwise, that verse could simply read, the fear of the Lord is wisdom. I was saved about 16 years ago. And I believe that to be following God out of fear or in a desire to get something out of it at this point in my walk, um, I don't think that can be defined as love. And I've got to say, I'm grateful that God does not require that we love him or anyone else in order to be saved, right? Because Paul summed up salvation in Romans 10, 9 to 13, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Confess and believe. Love is not a requirement. I'm grateful that God does not require that we love him in order to be saved because if love is a commitment, I need to be honest that there are times when I'm not committed. It's very easy to be committed to filling my own needs, but commitment to the good of others, that can be hard for me, especially when someone else's good seems to conflict with my good. But if love is a commitment to the good of another and love is a choice, and if Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 39, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Then at some point, I ought to stop worrying about what's good for me and start loving others, especially God. I shouldn't do this to be a rule follower, to be better than others and puffed up or out of a misplaced belief that it's the way to salvation. No, I should do it because I want to. And if I currently don't want to, well, then how thankful am I that I have the choice to decide to want to? I like to say that the best evidence that we have, that we have an actual and true will, is that those who believe they have control over their choices and take responsibility for their choices tend to make better choices and succeed more in life. And so knowing that I have power over my will If I notice that any part of me is motivated out of fear or selfishness, I can decide to change my motivation. I can decide to to change the way I feel. I can decide to do something for someone just because I'm committed to their good. I can clean the kitchen for my wife out of frustration that it's a mess and she hasn't done it, or I could do it because I want her to enjoy a clean kitchen. You know, I can shovel my neighbor's driveway so that he owes me one, or out of a feeling of self-righteousness, look how good I am. Or I can, it could just be for him. And I can stand here and preach to appear intellectual or to glorify myself. Or I can preach to glorify God and help shepherd his flock. If we truly love each other and God, it's critical that we search our hearts and know the motivation behind our thoughts and actions. So then what does it mean to be committed to God's good? I think it's possible that Loving God means something different to each person. But I think what applies to everyone is that we use our talents, our intellect, our strength, our time, and our words for his good. And then we ask, what good can we do for God? Well, first, we can obey him. We can have a desire to not grieve him with our thoughts and actions. We can do this out of a commitment to his good, not because we think we need to behave to earn blessings or to appear good to each other. I feel we sometimes behave or even hide our sins from our friends because we're looking for their approval. We ought to behave out of a genuine genuine commitment to God's good. Lust, pride, envy, malice, self-centeredness. Sometimes those sins are at the root of what appear to be our good behaviors. When we know the motivation behind our thoughts and actions, we can detect the temptation to let sins motivate us, and we could choose to change our motivation. We could take a thought captive. We can notice, wow, I want to do this or say this, but I can see what's truly in my heart in terms of what's motivating this right now. So I'm going to choose to do it for a different reason, or I'm just not going to do it or say it or think it or whatever at all. 
An example I can think of um, is 15 to 20 years ago when I engaged in behavior that really looked like evangelism. I would strike up conversations about the nature of right and wrong or absolute truth or creation versus evolution. But upon closer observation and the benefit of hindsight, I know today that I was doing those things for the wrong reasons. I wanted to appear a certain way or use those topics to appear intriguing or impress a woman I was attracted to or something like that. Nothing about what I was doing in these cases was about loving God, being committed to God's good. But then there's also the times when I'm not trying to appear particularly noble and I'm not doing anything obvious, obviously wrong. But on the inside, if I pay close attention to myself, I'll notice that when I see someone's new car or visit someone's home, I'll begin to compare what I have to what they have. And I'll, see, I'll wonder if I measure up or if what I have is better. It's, a, it's as though I believe that my value as a person is somehow tied to my possessions or my success. I've got this ego that's just always begging to be fed. And at my worst, I sometimes... I, this is humiliating, but I've, I've sometimes hated to see others succeed. It's as though at times I'm so selfish or prideful that I deserve, I believe I deserve all the, acclima- all the accolades, all the compliments, all the rewards, all the glory. All of this is, it's in there and it's humiliating to admit. But when I recognize all of these tendencies in myself, when I recognized it some years ago, I began to train myself through repetition to shut down those thoughts and motivations immediately and simply want the best for my neighbors, to want the best for my friends, the best for my family, the best for God, to be committed to their good, to recognize their achievements, to find joy in the fact that they have created a good life for themselves, to esteem them higher than myself, and in other words, to love them instead of comparing and competing to prove my own value to myself. Yes, there's a simple way of obeying God, which is to do our best to abstain from bad things, but there's a deeper way of obeying him, which is to remain committed to obedience day in and day out, and to be obedient not only with our actions, but with our thoughts and even our motivations. To do this, we only need to ask ourselves, why am I doing this really? Why am I thinking this really? Why am I saying this really? Psalm 1912 says, who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. That was a prayer of David's. Lord, cleanse me from secret faults. So then if the first way we can do good for God is through obedience to him, what's the second? Well, I think it's that we can defend him. This world is full of people who openly mock God They revel in their sin, they slander him, and at the same time, they insist that he isn't even there. And I've got to say, how bizarre is it to mock people and slander that you don't even believe exist? If I heard someone slandering a friend, I wouldn't let it stand. But oftentimes, if God is the target, I'll just let it go. I remember an employee I just hired made a comment to me about how he couldn't believe anyone would believe uh, that evolution is not true. To him, the idea that God created the world was ridiculous. But for me, gaining some random guy's approval who doesn't even work for me anymore was more important than simply saying, no, I'm pretty sure evolution is false. Yeah, in that moment, I cared more about what that guy thought about me than what God thought. I wasn't committed enough to God's good to stand up for God. And third, and I'll repeat that none of what I'm saying is required for salvation, obviously. These are just good rules of thumb for those who want to grow in love toward God. But third, we can bring people to him, right? This world is full of his lost children. He grieves at their sin and at the demise of their souls, and we could try to reach them for him. Imagine if one of your kids went missing or ran away from home. Imagine how committed to your good the one is who encounters them and tries to point them back to you. Evangelism is tough for me, but I'm working in myself to be committed enough to God's good to try to point his children back in his direction. So loving God is about committing ourselves to his good by obeying him, by defending him, and evangelizing. And it's important to note that when we work harder to love God in this way, we will fail. And when we do, we can thank God for his grace, move on, and continue reshaping our hearts 
to be more committed to his good. Well, now that we have some direction as to how we go about truly being committed to God's good, you may be asking, what about our neighbors, our spouse, our children? Well, I touched on it earlier. I think our commitment is unconditional. And since it's unconditional, we just have to contemplate what is the greatest good that can be achieved for this person, and then we act on it consistently, day in, day out, a thousand times a day. When it comes to our spouses, it means just making sure they know they are loved unconditionally. It means caring about them. It means knowing their needs, caring about their state of being, providing for them, resisting the urge to harm or betray them, and of course, always pointing them toward God because that is ultimately the greatest good. For our kids, being committed to their good means training them in the way they should go, right? It means building a relationship with them and being a good example. And all of this takes effort. It means reading books on parenting, asking friends for counseling. It means sacrificing my own me time, right? And pouring that out for my kids. It means not making excuses for their bad behavior and instead correcting it, as we were talking about in Sunday school. And for our neighbors, well, Christ told us to love our neighbor as ourselves, so I'll leave that to your imagination. But I will say this. When you think about our economy, it's based on neighbors serving each other. And we often think about it as though we do things for others so we can get paid, right? That's the way we imagine that we see the economy working. But the way you see it is really just a matter of perspective. Because another way to look at it is to say, I want to serve my neighbor for their good. So whatever I do in my work, my job, whatever it is that I'm doing, I'm doing it for them. I'm not doing it for me. And if someone wants to do good for me in return, well, I should let them, right? I shouldn't reject their love. I shouldn't reject their commitment to me in, in false humility or misplaced humility. This is how our entire economy should work. You pay someone for their work as a way of acknowledging, you've blessed me, take this money as a sign that I will do good for you back. And you accept money as a way of accepting their commitment to your good. Money is just a way of keeping track of society's debt to a person for services rendered, right? The money we have signifies how much we are owed in goods and services from our community, from society. But we ought, we ought not to do for others to get anything in return. A society wherein neighbors truly love each other will insist that the other gets the good, and if good is done for you, you will want to repay that good, not the other way around. Now, Christians and unbelievers alike, we're all too selfish to make a system like that work here on earth, uh, and we do have to make sure we get paid to survive. But just contemplate for a moment what it'd be like if everyone's primary focus was the well-being of their neighbor. And... and and we were all falling all over each other to help each other out. And when someone did something for us, we were so blown away that we insisted we repay the favor. And then it turns into a fight because, no, 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 I just want to do this for you. I don't want anything in return, really. And then, he, and then you know, he's replying, no, 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 I'm going to do even more for you than you did for me. Thank you. I'm so grateful. Can you imagine if everyone in the world behaved that way? So often we're all focused on achieving good for ourselves, we fail to realize that if everyone followed this law of love, this greatest commandment, we'd be so much better off. I mean, which is better? For everyone to be focused on themselves and filling their own needs, right? If everyone follows that path, how many people do each of us have fussing over us? One. Just one. But if each of us is focused on the good of those around us, we cannot even begin to count the number of those committed to our good. So if we could, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 13. And like, we, like I mentioned for the announcements, uh, we're going to be in Corinth April of next year. So if you want to stand in the place where Paul wrote this letter to, uh, it's, it had a huge impact on me as a teenager and I think it'll have a big impact on you guys, too. <clears throat> so 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. So our translation says clanging cymbal. 
Uh, but the Greek word there is alaladzon, if I'm saying that right. I don't know Greek, but we're doing a Greek class, so attend, it's fun. Uh, but that, that word alaladzon, which it literally means screaming. So a screaming symbol. It's not talking about nice music. This is saying, even if our words and actions seem good, if they're without love, that is, if that commitment to someone's good is absent from those good words and actions, then our words and actions are like a screaming symbol, just pointless, ugly noise. This reminds me of that verse that says, even our good works are like filthy rags in the eyes of the Lord. So continuing on. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. You can see how all of this is just so clear, how love is not about me, it's about Me being committed to someone else's good. Does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Here the Greek word stege has been translated bears, so bears all things. But a better translation seems to be excludes, abstains from, foregoes. So Love forgoes all things. To me, this means love is like disciplined and self-sacrificing. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. And the last little caveat at the beginning of the verse where it says love never fails, the Greek word ekpipte, ekpipte, is translated fails here, but a better translation would be that love is not lapsing. Love does not expire. So in other words, love is a continuous commitment. And let's skip down to verse 13 for the best part, my favorite part. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Love is such a basic foundational principle of Christianity, but it's so easy to relegate it to a mere reflex or a feeling. I want to close with a reading in John chapter 1, verses 15 to 17. So please turn to the gospel there, John chapter 21, verse 15 to 17. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me more than these? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. And Jesus said to Peter again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you phileo me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you phileo me? When Peter was asked if he loved God, he couldn't bring himself to use the term agape for love, that true godly love. He insisted instead that he phileoed God, that is, that he's fond of God, he has brotherly love for God. But God knew Peter's heart and finally challenged Peter, asking, Are you even fond of me? Let's not trick ourselves into believing that we love someone we truly don't. Let's know our motivations, and let's be sure not to confuse love with fondness or infatuation. Love is the commitment to the good of others. It's a choice we have the opportunity to make a thousand times a day. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for loving us and being so committed to our good. And I'm so sorry that I've been selfish and not committed to yours. Help me, Lord, to love you more, to be committed to you, and to care more what you think about me than what anyone else does. Love you, pray in your name. Amen.